beginning to fade. Uh, it's probably because uh, as we move closer towards the end of the day, we start, the other things that we've seen around Kigali start confusing us and then becomes uh, a bit of a problem to concentrate on the reason for which we are in the country. But uh, welcome again to the very exciting session around insurance for strengthening the resilience of vulnerable African populations and how we can overcome those obstacles. A friend of mine went to the office today and didn't find me. He asked me, Charles, where are you? You're not at work. I told him that uh, there is this uh, event I'm, here, I'm handling for around microfinance. So then he tells me, ah, those guys who lend in coins and get paid back in notes. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't confuse them with the bankers, the real big bankers. Because the bankers are the ones who lend you an umbrella when there is a lot of sunshine. And then they want it back the moment it starts raining. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Matthew, who will be taking us through the afternoon, through the session that we're going to have right now. Uh, Matthew is with uh, ADA. We, he has uh, more than 11 years of experience in development finance in that space. And uh, you'll be very pleased to know as well that specifically he's been doing technical assistance for microfinance institutions for more than five years. Matthew, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Charles. Hopefully, uh, the thinning out of the crowd doesn't have anything to do with the topic of insurance. It's not always the most um, invigorating uh, topic to talk about, but welcome to this uh, session on insurance, resilience, and, um, and uh, you know, I'm very pleased to be here, and I can see Ovia in the crowd now. Ovia, please come and join us. Ovia, is on the panel. She was a little bit late because she had a, a meeting with the regulators. And any person who manages a financial institution and has a meeting with the regulators, uh, they can't miss it, even if they do have a panel. So thanks for making the effort of you. Um, so my name is Matthew Genazzini. I uh, work for ADA, as Charles said, but I'm actually here um, uh, in the capacity as board member of the Microinsurance Network. Um, and I just want to see a raise of hands. Who knows, who's heard of the Microinsurance Network uh, b before? Those are some of my colleagues. They should be putting up their hands. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> just, to, just, ma just maybe just to quickly, the Microinsurance Network is a network of organizations that are involved in the promotion and the delivery of insurance products for low-income people. It brings together around 70 institutional members representing around 400 people, all working uh, throughout the globe in promoting microinsurance to low-income low income populations. Um, the, the, the network is made up not only of insurance companies, but also reinsurance companies. Um, our panelists, some of our panelists are members of the microinsurance network. We also have development organizations, multilateral, bilateral uh, agencies. And, and also universities. So it's an it's a, it's a eclectic mix of organizations that are all working towards this, this, this promotion. And unfortunately, the director, uh, Catherine, was unable to, to come to Kigali, um, and so I'm here taking her place. The other thing to mention about the, the network is that it's financed by the Luxembourg government as well. And it's just another example of how you know, the Luxembourg government is leading the way in in promoting inclusive insurance, uh, or promoting inclusive finance, I should say, uh, throughout the globe. So when I was starting to think about how I was gonna introduce this session today, I thought I would start off with a joke. And so I went on the internet looking for insurance jokes that I could maybe kind of share with you. And actually I found no, <laughs> no good insurance jokes. They just don't exist or they don't cater for what we're trying to do here. 
Um, all the jokes that I found had a negative undertone about insurance. It all talked about how uh, actuaries are incredibly dull, which is not the case. Um, I know many actuaries and they, they're quite a lot of fun. Um, it talked about how insurance salespersons are dishonest. It talked about how insurance companies are always ripping people off. And this reputation that insurance has is a, is a real shame. And, and I think we need to kind of all work together to, to try and um, change this perception of insurance. Insurance is an incredibly powerful tool to manage risks. Um, it's, it, uh, in its sense, it's just the sharing of risks. It's, a, it's very social in its, in its being. And it's a sharing of risks between a group of people whereby if a shock, if a crisis happens to one of them, they're in a position to be able to come back and be more resilient because we shared that risk amongst ourselves. So, you know, insurance might have a bad reputation, but I'd really like to kind of um, ask all of you to, to help us change this reputation of, of insurance and, and uh, unleash, this is quite dramatic, unleash the power of insurance. I know it's quite dramatic, but my panelists here today are going to talk about how they are unleashing the, pa the, the power of insurance within their organizations. And we've got three panelists today, two of whom are from microfinance associations. So they're associations that group microfinance institutions and are in a really unique position of being able to aggregate clients and be able to reach masses. And if you know anything about insurance, you know that you need a lot of people buying your product to be, for it to be viable. And without that, you won't be able to achieve sustainability. So microfinance associations are incredibly, are, are in a unique position to be able to kind of achieve that. And we've got, we've got Rogers from <laughs> the Nigerian microfinance plat uh, platform. And we've also got Syed and Ali from the Pakistan microfinance network who will be sharing with us their experience and how they've de designed, delivered, and put in place um, insurance products for their members. And then lastly, but definitely not least, we've got the perspective from an insurance company, and that's uh, obvious. And not any insurance company, the first and only micro-insurance company in Rwanda. So she's going to come with her experience of how she works with financial institutions in terms of delivering insurance products. So that's enough from me. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Ali and Syed from the Pakistan Microfinance Network, who are going to be joining us remotely, hopefully. And I'm hoping this is going to work. No, I'm getting a no. <laughs> I'm getting a no. OK. Uh, plan B. Rogers, how would you like to take the floor first? And, uh, and and talk about your 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 experience. Do you want to take the? Do you want to sit at the, there or do you want to take it there? Up to you. Up to you. One. Um, my name is Rogers. I sit here on behalf of the Nigerian Microfinance uh, Platform. The Nigerian Microfinance Platform is established as. Um, a sector development um, policy advocacy platform to support um, the development of microfinance in Nigeria. It is chaired by the Central Bank of Nigeria and has all the stakeholders in microfinance in Nigeria. Um, basically, what we want to do here today is to demonstrate how the Nigeria microfinance platform is using a microinsurance project to building resilience among uh, microfinance uh, institutions. Because it's a project that is new, just um, about a year old, and uh, currently being pilot tested, where our expectations here today is that um, this session will be very interactive and that you will be able to you know, talk with us and let us share experiences. We are excited that the Pakistani microfinance network is here who have had a successful tenure, and I have also over here who runs insurance, so we'll be able to take back a lot of uh, 
ideas home. Um, a little bit about the uh, Nigeria Microfinance Platform, which is supported by AFOS Foundation. Like I said, the Nigeria Microfinance Platform um, is made up of uh, the regulators, the microfinance institutions, the development partners, the credit bureaus, you know, indeed, everybody who is um, active in the microfinance space is a member of uh, the Nigeria Microfinance Platform. And uh, we work through eight um, working groups. Um, one is the working group on microinsurance, on capacity building, on savings, mobilization, and digital finance. We have also a platform on our corporate uh, governance, and we have on efficiency and social uh, performance. These working groups work independently um, to drive the activities of uh, you know, the platform. And the Air Force Foundation, which has been supporting microfinance over the last decade, is an international NGO funded by the German government, uh, specifically the Ministry of uh, um, Economic Cooperation and um, Development. So basically what we want to do here today is um, to tell our story of what we have been able to do over the last um, one year, um, so that um, those who want to start um, a program to achieve resilience for our institutions will probably have a lot or a little to hear, you know, work with us. Or those who also have had some experience can also um, share with us. So our experience actually started after the COVID-19 um, last year. There was a lockdown in Nigeria for about five months, and many cities you know, could not move like this. The experience of many people from different countries, and um, sometime in July, it was lifted, and um, life was getting back to normal. And we realized that many of the microfinance institutions in Nigeria could not you know, do any um, business. Many who were not digitally enabled had to shut down, and so, the question come, how do we support our institutions to survive in you know, times like this? And so this project has its origin from that point. Um, what did we do first is that um, we did a survey. That survey is um, to find out what the current uh, position is with our um, institutions. And um, we wanted to find out what was going on. We wanted to find out from people, how did you cope during the um, COVID-19 lockdown? We wanted to also find out, even before lockdown, what are the issues that you have? Um, I'm sorry, this is no longer moving, if they can uh, check it. So what is exactly going on? And we were getting, exactly, thank you. We were getting responses from um, our members around okay, we were not digitally enabled, we were not expecting the lockdown, and we were shut down, we couldn't reach our clients. And of course, many clients took advantage of that position to say they cannot pay their debt. It, not every city in Nigeria was locked down, but even those who were not locked down, as you will understand the nature of micro clients, you know, everybody used COVID as an excuse not to pay their loans, but beyond COVID, we also found out from our institutions that there are people who could not pay their loans, and we tried to find out why um, don't you pay your loans, and we got excuses like, um, I took ill, my wife took ill, we were hospitalized, and we used the loan amounts to, you know, get uh, hospital expenses paid, and so we cannot pay loan. We have people who, uh, those that are, you know, taking their goods from the farm to the city, and then there is an accident and we lost all the goods. You know, so we put together all these responses from the survey, and we decided that, okay, so what do, how do we move forward? The second thing we did was to hold a multi-stakeholder workshop, um, bringing in all the participants and the critical stakeholders in the insurance industry, we brought in the, the regulator for microfinance, which is the Central Bank of Nigeria. We also brought in the regulator for insurance, uh, the Nigerian um, Insurance Commission. We brought in um, insurance companies. We brought in microfinance banks. We brought in um, you know, um, consultants in that space. 
and we said, how do we build resilience for our institutions you know, to survive, and how do we use micro-insurance as a tool to deal with the vulnerabilities of our institutions? Um, that's, that, that was the beginning, and we realized from that exercise that insurance, especially micro-insurance uptake in Nigeria is very, very low. Um, if you say it doesn't exist, you won't um, even be making a mistake, but we tried to you know, find out why, and we realized that some of these products that are being designed for micro-insurance do not meet the needs of our micro-clients. Um, if you are going to do insurance, you probably take ready-made insurance products from the insurance company to sell, or uh, some of the institutions were self-insuring. You know, and so we came with the idea that we need to develop uh, micro-insurance products for the micro-finance uh, institutions. So we started a training program on uh, product development for micro-insurance. That took us around the country. Um, we trained close to about 300 microfinance uh, um, institutions on how to develop um, their own micro-insurance products. At the end of that pro uh, program, we had a product development workshop where, based on information that was gathered going around the country and um, you know, conducting the trainings, we were able to come up with five micro-insurance products. Of course, the first one is the credit life uh, insurance, which we looked at what all the institutions were doing, and we come up with a, pro a, a product that is significantly different, significantly different, and this is important in the sense that most insurance products for credit life are targeted at the banks getting back their money when something goes wrong. So if a client borrows uh, $200 and then as at the time he probably passes on, he is now owing $50, everybody builds products around getting back that $50 so that the bank can get paid. And the question is what now happens to the family that is left behind? So we designed a product that says no, you should take into cognizance the future of that uh, micro client and his family. So if you insured for say $500 uh, and as at the time there is a problem, you uh, covered, you have 200 remaining, you should pay back the 500 so that after the bank has taken money and get repaid, there should be something left for that uh, family to continue. And so we, we, we had the, the five products, the micro, uh, the, say, the um, credit life insurance. We also have the operational risk insurance that covers fire, burglary, goods in transit, and all other risks that happen in, in the course of uh, operations. We also um, created a product for what we call special perils, which covers things like flood, um, things like um, uh, insurgency, erosion, you know, and all that. And then we also developed a health insurance product such that if you have a loan, um, you automatically qualify to get um, health coverage throughout the tenor of that uh, loan. And finally, we also developed um, a set of products to cover agric um, insurance. So these products, we <coughs> passed through the MFBs who accepted it, and, um, and um, eventually we started the pilot testing in August this year. So this is the third month of running a pilot uh, scheme for that product, and it's going to run for about 12 months. Um, we make sure we correct all the issues and then we can then pass it on for the microfinance bank. So the whole idea has been to enable microfinance um, institutions in Nigeria be able to offer insurance as um, a, a deliverable, as a, as a product um, to help create and build um, resilience for the institutions. Um, just quickly for a round up, just for information, um, insurance in Nigeria has taken a very um, a slow pace. Um, be before 2000 and, uh, or the period between 2010 and 16, there was no form of regulation or activity around microinsurance. Um, the um, regulatory agency uh, made a few attempts, but um, they were not so successful until 2018 when the guidelines for microinsurance was uh, 
you know, launched. Today, the uptake is still very, very low, but we see huge opportunities. For example, today, there are about 14 million clients of uh, microfinance uh, uh, banks. That is just for the banks. Now, if we add for the non-regulated microfinance institutions, it means we have uh, close to uh, 20, 25 million clients um, that uh, are already being uh, served. Out of the 14 million microfinance clients served by the microfinance banks, about six uh, to 6.5 million have loans, okay? So when we complete the process of developing these products and all the microfinance banks adopt them, there is um, expected to be an upward movement because these uh, uh, products are mandatory for people who are taking loans. And so you're going to see insurance uptake move from far below a million naira to about six or even seven million uh, within the next one or two years as we get these products um, adopted. The opportunities are there, and so what we have decided to uh, do are basically three things. So we ask and we are pursuing a system of collaboration because for this to work, there has to be a strong collaboration between the central bank, which is the microfinance regulator, and the NICOM, which is the insurance regulator. The other thing that we are uh, hoping to do is that we should be able to develop new products and continue to innovate new ideas that um, have been uh, non-existent. And we hope that we can use that process to disrupt the micro-insurance market in Nigeria. And hopefully, when this is done, we'll be able to overcome all the obstacles that microfinance institutions go through in product uh, delivery. So that's basically what is coming from me. I'll appreciate participation and uh, questions so that we can talk a lot more about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rogers. Um, it, it's really interesting to see, you know, how a microfinance association is at the beginning, well, starting off their, their process um, and seeing the, the obstacles. It's great to see that you're working, already working with the regulators and, and, and advocacy as well is also an important aspect of that. Um, I, I'm, I'm being told that we are connected to Pakistan. So Syed and Ali from the Pakistan Microfinance Network are going to join us and tell us about their experience, who have a much longer experience in terms of microinsurance. They started, I think, uh, around 10 years ago, um, but I'll let, you, I'll let them uh, tell you all about it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so there is, there is this confusion. It is me that is present. I only requested because I thought that this session will start an hour earlier and I was uh, called in for a meeting at the Ministry of Finance, but I am here. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, okay, Pakistan Microfinance Network in terms of our focus on micro insurance and our uh, the, the, this role that we took uh, post the COVID-19. Uh, I'll start with the COVID-19 then. And uh, um, you, uh, so the Pakistan uh, went into its first lockdown in March 2020. And the image, so we have two kinds of players in Pakistan. One is microfinance banks, which are deposit taking entities re regulated by the Central Bank of Pakistan. And the other one is the non-bank microfinance companies, which are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission of Pakistan. And the business of micro insurance or insurance is also regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission of Pakistan. So SECP oversees both lending for non-bank microfinance companies and insurance business in the country. Uh, but coming back to uh, the uh, COVID situation, so we immediately after the lockdown, we got in touch with both the regulators, SECP and State Bank of Pakistan uh, for loan deferment and also to request for liquidity support uh, in, at that time. Uh, as we were in discussion on that, uh, what we came to know was that the government announced, uh, both the federal and the state governments announced uh, lockdowns along with allowing certain essential facilities to continue. And uh, banking was part of that essential services, which included microfinance banks, but uh, microfinance or non-bank services were not part of the essential so it, it was no more a question of just asking for liquidity or different support, but also continuity support. So we 
had to engage with the federal government and the provincial governments for uh, a lot of businesses, especially uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, both uh, loan, uh, rec more specifically recovery, but also disbursement uh, for certain categories of uh, businesses that were allowed to continue. Uh, we got very good re response from the government and also from the regulators. The government allowed the continuity of business for non-banks in four provinces. The two other provinces just uh, didn't respond to our request. But microfinance predominantly was um, in one of those four prov provinces, so that helped. Similarly, SECP immediately allowed uh, uh, deferment and, uh, of the loan amount. For a period of one year uh, up till uh, and they allowed time till J initially June and then September. Similarly, State Bank of Pakistan also allowed uh, deferment for microfinance banks. And this was not just for microfinance banks, but also their own, uh, and I mean not just microfinance banks, but commercial banks also. So that helped the non banks in terms of their uh, funding comes from from the banks in addition to uh, our uh, APEC, which is PM Pakistan Microfinance Investment Company, and also uh, the, uh, some microfinance investment vehicles from uh, Europe and US. So especially for the commercial bank lending and PMIC lending to microfinance, uh, non-bank microfinance companies, that helped in their loan deferment also. So that eased uh, the, pay, the, the, the uh, the liquidity problem to a certain extent. A at the same, within a month also, the government of Pakistan through State Bank of Pakistan came up with a liquidity facility, uh, which was uh, called salary and wages scheme for SMEs. They allowed non-bank microfinance companies to uh, take this credit line. This was a six month loan, uh, uh, which was extended to, an eight, to a year re -pay payable after a, a grace period of three to six months over a period of two to three years uh, at, a, at a discount, at a 50% discount to treasury bill rates. Uh, the third facility that came from the central bank was in the form of lowering of uh, monetary uh, policy. So, so the discount went down by almost, I would say one third. Uh, so that uh, eased up the costs uh, of the businesses also. So we were able to get deferments, uh, business continuity, uh, liquidity, uh, but the liquidity was subject to some very clear compulsion that you will not lay off any staff during that period of time, uh, during the COVID period of time. That was the last one I forgot. Uh, and then the, re the, the reduction in the discount rates. Uh, so that is, uh, and then our members, so after, uh, so Pakistan uh, was blessed with the fact that we, we were able to come out of the lockdown uh, around July, August, because the first wave ended, but then we had uh, another three waves, uh, so the last one ended only three weeks back, uh, which was our fourth wave. Uh, things are now much better, uh, uh, almost half of the population is vaccinated. And I think one quarter is vaccinated uh, uh, to, for both the shots. Um, and uh, so businesses are now going normal. Our uh, infection rate right now is uh, around 1.6%. Uh, so we have really smoothed out. So we are looking at a much better 2022, uh, inshallah, by when, when it's January. Uh, in terms of our insurance services, so, uh, so, so, so I will say that insurance started around 2006, 2007 in Pakistan. And that was by individual institutions themselves. So they were coming up with products like uh, life insurance, which was essentially a risk mitigation also against their loan exposure. Uh, which, and then there was added uh, facilities in the form of uh, funeral services or uh, uh, a loan repayment uh, uh, for for widows, etc. Uh, similarly, in, as but as the relationship and the relationship was the model was agent agency model. So largely, the MF uh, sector was engaging with commercial insurance companies, and so they were basically underwriting the loan, and we were providing the the the, the, the grassroots outreach. Uh, however, as the relationship matured, we, 
our members started providing beyond credit and uh, additional services. We also started providing health service. However, PMN came in when around 2011, uh, a few uh, staff from SECP, their insurance department, they visited our office and they said that they are not comfortable with the claim ratio. And they, they have done some, they want to have an engagement with the industry in terms of what is going wrong in that. Is this an issue of uh, literacy? Uh, what about, is this a mandatory product? Uh, is this an issue uh, of uh, wrong kind of information being passed off? Uh, but when what we found out that it was largely an issue of that the infrastructure of uh, health was not in commensuration with the uh, the kind of services that were being provided, especially in the peri-urban and the hinterland parts of the country. Uh, so, so, so that helped in evo evo evolution of the product. We also did a research, I think, in the late 2010s, uh, in, the, in the middle of uh, that, uh, that decade. And what we found out was that, that from the demand side, one of the key products that the car not just uh, life or health, but uh, life cycle events. So uh, how can we cover the cost of our children education? What about post-retirement? What about uh daughter's uh, marriage so like, like the african countries where funeral costs are very high over here marriage costs of daughters are very uh, extensive and so the cost to cover a marriage is very high so they they were saying that how come how can insurance and long-term savings help in addressing these life cycle issues so that is where then we started incubating the micro insurance a business into our overall uh, PM and services, which include knowledge management, research, uh, interacting with the insurance industry as we were interacting with the banking industry or uh, any other uh, uh, industry, uh, the the, uh, the asset management companies, etc. So insurance became uh, where we started focusing on, and uh, so now products and services being offered. Uh, and uh, and I and I think uh, the realization after our conference that concluded only ten days back was that we should need to have more interaction with, with more of the insurance companies, and they should be as much part of the ecosystem as the banking industry is. So I will end here, and I am open to questions at the end of the session. Thank you, thank you very much, Said, for that insightful. Uh, view on, um, on on your experience in developing and, and promoting insurance. Can we get the slides back, the right ones? Because I don't think these are the correct ones. No. So, so we're going to pass on to Ovia. Um, Ovia, yes, there we go, thanks. Oh yeah, I'm going to pass you the. Um, yeah. I'll let you present yourself. Oh yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ovia Kamanz Tairwe. I'm the CEO of uh, Radiant Yachu <coughs> Micro Insurance Company. Uh, so, uh, without wasting much of your time, let's go through uh, my simple presentations, uh, my simple slides that I prepared for you. I'll be uh, talking about uh, microinsurance in Rwanda, just briefly, and then uh, I'll take you through uh, how we team up with the microfinance institutions um, uh, for business partnership. Uh, so, um, it's not moving? Ah, okay, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, uh, Rwanda's microinsurance regulation was gazetted on the 24th of December 2018, uh, of course, uh, with the purpose of creating a conducive uh, environment for microinsurance uh, business, uh, protect the microinsurance policyholders, and promote uh, microinsurance business in Rwanda. Uh, so far, uh, we have only one dedicated uh, microinsurance company, uh, which is Radiant Yachu. 
And uh, the company is trying to meet the unmet needs of low-income earners, uh, like you all know. And uh, of course, uh, serve the underserved and underserved market segments of our population. Um, so basically, the animate needs of our low-income earners um, include, but not limited to, proper medical care, although uh, most of them here access uh, free universal um, medical care called Mituel Dosante. Uh, access to coverages like life insurance, property insurance, but most importantly, uh, crop and livestock. I mean, agriculture insurance for that matter. Uh, because uh, most of our people here, like 82% of our total households, uh, they, they are in involved in agriculture. So uh, there is uh, potential there. Uh, now uh, about uh, Radiant Yachu. Uh, like I said, it's the only dedicated microinsurance company that was licensed to do composite products. By composite products, I mean uh, we are licensed to do uh, both life and non-life microinsurance products. And the company was licensed in uh, 2019, so it's really still young, um, like three years almost. And um, we, uh, we are trying to really uh, bridge the gap. You know, uh, the insurance penetration in Rwanda is still very low. It's at 1.6%. So we are trying our best to see how we can, uh, of course, um, bring it up uh, by serving uh, the underserved and underserved market segments. So now I'll take you through how we team up with banks and microfinance institutions. Uh, I must say that uh, microfinance institutions are the most and our common um, distribution channel for some of our products. And uh, they have really, uh, given us a positive impact, like we've increased our sales uh, uh, by, using, uh, by selling our products through them. So far we've patterned with a few of them, of course not all, uh, but I'm sure uh, some are in the pipeline and uh, some will, we shall pattern with them very soon. So, so far we have on board uh, Uruego Bank, we have a MIFA microfinance institution, we have a Maseserano, MFI, Vision Fund Rwanda, we have Umutangwa Microfinance, we have Action Tunga, we have RIM finance, Microfinance. Uh, and of course, yeah, we also work with the circles uh, across the country. Uh, so you may ask yourself, uh, which products do we, uh, do we do, or do we uh, pattern in with the banks? We have uh, Credit Life, uh, it's actually the common product that we do with the um, microfinance institutions. Uh, we also have livestock. We do livestock as part of agriculture product. Uh, in livestock, we insure cattle. Uh, cattle, I mean milking cattle and heifers. We don't insure bulls. We insure piggery and we insure poultry. And then we also uh, do crops with MFIs, uh, whereby uh, we insure rice, because they give loans to, these, uh, to, to, to clients. And these crops have to be insured because in case of a loss, if the, the, the crop is not insured, you see the bank will lose, the microfinance will lose the money. So we give them um, insurance, uh, credit life, and again, the cover for that particular crop because we have uh, that product also uh, that we do together with, um, with the government, Minister of Agriculture and uh, with the support of Access Finance Rwanda, and I thank them so much. So we are doing these uh, products uh, together with the um, uh, Minister of Agriculture. We insure maize, we insure chili, we insure French beans, we insure Irish potatoes and uh, chia seeds. You may ask yourself as how do we get partner with the microfinance institutions? How do we, what's the journey? How do we get there? Um, um, I might not say the journey is simple, it's not simple at all, but uh, we try, we try, and uh, what we do first, we approach uh, these microfinance institutions, but some do approach us, uh, but to a bigger extent, it's us, it's we that go to them and propose a business partnership. And um, after welcoming us and giving us a, a red carpet, I mean like a green light, 
Uh, we design a win-win uh, business case. We start designing uh, products, but in a win-win manner. Win-win uh, -win manner, I mean, uh, of course, they have to see value in that product. Value for them as a microfinance institution, but also value for their clients, most importantly. So um, we may have the product already, like Credit Life, we all know. It's like uh, death, permanent disability, and all that stuff. But whatever products we put on the market or we propose our partners, they, ha they have, there is some sense of centricity, like uh, centric approach is applied. So we approach them, of course, they know their clients better. They propose, we give them what we have, but of course they know what their clients needs. So sometimes you find that the partnership or the contract that we have with microfinance A may be different. The product is the same, but the covers or the guarantees inside are different depending on, the on their client's needs. So customer-centric approach is uh, highly apl applied. And uh, after designing a win-win situation, um, again, for your information here in Rwanda, there is a regulation uh, whereby banks, microfinance institution, or any other um, financial institution for that matter, they, they can register to be agents of any insurance company, and they earn commission on the business that they bring for that particular insurance company. So yeah, commission also comes in here for those banks that have license uh, to operate as agents, and those that don't, of course, there are other benefits that uh, uh, they, they get from a partnership, like, you know, serving their clients on time, uh, you know, and all that stuff, and having their claims paid on time, uh, things like that. So we discuss MOU draft, we share MOU with them, and uh, if we agree, we sign the MOU, and then uh, we train the MFI staff uh, about our products and the writing parameters. After training the staff, you know, loan officers, and um, whoever they give us to train, we give them underwriting software or system and do integrations where it's required or where necessary. So that's the simple journey that we go through to partner with MFIs. So I call upon MFIs present here. If uh, you haven't gone through this journey with us, please, uh, you can contact me after this meeting. So um, like I said, partnering with MFIs have led uh, our business to grow in a positive way. We started in uh, 2019, the company is still young and the products that we sell are still new. So don't be surprised by these uh, small figures that you see here, but uh, just look at the growth, how we grew from 2019. Uh, this is Credit Life. We were able to underwrite uh, uh, 17,000 just for, for one year. This is really small premium, but 2020 last year, that is after one year, we were able to collect uh, to collect 99,910 US dollars, which was really a big jump. So, and uh, we, uh, I mean, this is because of uh, that partnership uh, that I've talked about. And this year, as at end September, we are 292,919 US dollars, which is really, again, very huge for us because it's a new company, new product, and uh, we really thank them for, you know, having given us this, uh, this growth. And uh, when it comes to livestock, uh, the first year that we operated in 2019, we were able to underwrite 55,000 US dollars. And uh, 2020, we were able to underwrite 163,402 US dollars, which is a 295% jump. So it's also a, a very good uh, step. So at end September 2021, uh, we are at 360 US dollars, uh, and we have a growth of 220%. This is also a, a very, very good uh, growth for us. And I also, again, would like to thank Access to Finance because they helped us a lot in here, of course, connecting us with uh, some of the microfinance institutions and all the support they are, that they, are, they, they have given us so far. We thank them so much. Crop insurance, uh, we, first year we were able to underwrite 18,311 US dollars. And 2020 we were able to underwrite 393,523 US dollars, which is really a very, very big jump. Uh, we grew by 2,149%.
and uh, this is uh, all because of, uh, of you people, uh, the microfinance institutions that we are working with. And this year at end September, we are at 453, which is also very good. And we are at 115 uh, growth, which is also uh, something that we, appre we appreciate your support. So there are so many things that uh, we are planning to do with microfinance institutions. And I'm sure there are so many things that you're planning to do with us. We are here. Please, anything, we are, we are here to support. Thank you so much, Morocco Zechan. Thank you, thank you, Ovia. It's, it's great to see that the growth in your in, in your portfolio. One of the things that I'm, I'm going to ask um, Rogers and maybe Said uh, to answer, and it's it's on the bringing value to the microfinance institution itself. Um, I was uh, reading an evaluation of a project in in Latin America where they. They developed a, an insurance product that was very client-centric, and it was a very a product that had enormous value for the client. But within their project, what they forgot to take into account was how are we going to add value to the institution themselves? And so they had this amazing product, but none of the microfinance institutions within, within, within the program were wanting to sell it because they didn't see any value in it. And so my question is, how can you, how can you ensure that the, the, the microfinance institutions or the distribution model, the distribution channel, um, have, see value and have value within, within, through selling insurance products. And what, what, uh, materially, what is that? Hello. OK. So the whole essence of the project is to create value for both the clients and the institutions. And this is in two folds. So first is that the microfinance banks are getting reluctant to lend because of the high default rates, because the clients are not protected. So by creating this protection, um, our expectation is that the rate of defaults are going to decrease. So a client will not tell you that he has used the loan amount to go to hospital because you have provided health coverage. He cannot tell you that um, the principal died, um, there is you know, coverage. So first is that the institutions are going to get you know, um, their facilities back. The, the second value is that the, client, the, the, the institutions also end revenue because premium is shared. Okay, so unlike when you, you pay, uh, you sell insurance as an agent of the insurance company and just be paid a commission, in this instance, you have developed your own products which an insurance company underwrites for you. So, and there is uh, appropriation of uh, premium. So it's a new income stream for the customers. The, the third thing is about sustainability and uh, taking out the vulnerability of these clients. You know, uh, insurance, I don't know what it is in the countries you come from, but in my country, insurance is very, very low. People don't want to take um, insurance. And in fact, I, I ask many people, if the policeman will not stop you on the road to ask for insurance for a car, will you take insurance? Many people will say no, they won't take it, you know, because it's compulsory. But when people see why they have to take you know, insurance. So the value that comes is that you don't just insure to protect yourself without protecting the client. Um, I had a discussion with one of uh, our insurance companies in my bank, and you know, we're taking insurance for our bank building, and then they insist, you know, the, the, the institution that is financing us that they must be recorded as the first loss payee, which means if the building comes down on fire, the insurance company must pay the bank. So I said, okay, I thought we were insuring so that we can replace the building which you have as a collateral. So if the building gets gutted by fire and the insurance company pays you and you take the money and pay your loan, what happens to my institution? So the value here is that we are creating um, a system, products that benefit the institution, the clients. So like credit life insurance, like I explained, if there is debt or permanent disability, you pay the insured value. 
and not what is the outstanding loan. Because when you pay the outstanding loan, only the bank benefit. They get money to pay their loan. What happens to the client? If a client suffers loss, goods in transit is lost, or fire or something, you pay the full insured value. The bank takes what is left unpaid, and there is a balance left. You know, So it is a system that guarantees um, um, a value, pro provides a stronger value um, you know, proposition to the clients and not just to the institution. Thanks, Rogers. I was wondering whether Said had any uh, insights into uh, creating value for their microfinance distribution channels. I think uh, the response will be in terms of uh, so how does you cre do you create uh, value for the intermediary, which is microfinance organization? In that case, uh, that what we will need to focus on is. <coughs> When, that when we are designing a product, how is that going to be value uh, addable to the clients? Because intermediaries in any case, the microfinance institutions are uh, smart enough, they have the capacity, the financial muscle and the HR uh, to determine how is it going to be valuable to them uh, in terms of both financial benefits and also in terms of the supply side products that they can come up with. So uh, very few entities will do a complete uh, demand side survey to, to come up with a product uh, that matches their need. So it's not an issue for us uh, uh, to, uh, to, to work around how can this be helpful to MF, uh, to the microfinance industry. What is more critical is the distribution channel. So the discussions in Pakistan, which was part of our conference, was also how can uh, digitization or tech be helpful in uh, um, in in uh, product distribution and also making product more uh, cost effective and its availability at the last mile. Thanks, thanks, Said. Maybe coming coming to you of your you know you work with microfinance institutions. You talked about giving giving them value, and you also mentioned client centric approach. Can you tell us a little bit more about what what that means? Who, who when you're talking about clients, who are your clients? Are they the end ones? Are they the institutions? Can you tell us more? Yeah, thank you, Matthew, for that uh, great question. Yeah. Um, Working with uh, microfinance institutions, like I said, uh, we, ap we apply a customer centrist approach, uh, whereby we don't just carry our products and we say that's how it is, uh, period, so take it or leave it. No, we have to consult them. We have this, so how, how will it look with your clients? How will it, will it really? Uh, will it add value to your clients? Will, will it add value to you as a microfinance institution? So they again look through what we've proposed them and then they advise us. Maybe here, uh, for example, uh, recently uh, we signed uh, Nemo U with the Omutanguha microfinance institutions. But what we had proposed them, they were like, okay, yeah, we agree, this could be some, but there is one more thing that is very important and our clients really would love to have this. And uh, that was, we have this package of uh, credit life as cre credit life where we cover, uh, where we have a funeral, or we have uh, death, we have total permanent dis disability, critical illness and uh, retrenchment. And they were like, no, now what if that will benefit the bank? Now what if our client dies you only repay the outstanding loan amount, but what will happen to this family? So we had to add something like, you know, funeral cover, and th that way we feel it was like customers, we, we, they were thinking about our, their customers, and us as an insurance company were like, wow, that's great. So we already have this product, let's now, you know, add it to what we are providing you in a, in a credit life cover, so that if this family, uh, spouse or the principal dies, 
there is something that they get from us as an insurance company whereby they can help, it can help them bury this person in respect and maybe remain with some to keep the family moving. So we really do our best to apply our, the customer centric approach, not only we as Radiant Yacht, but uh, we uh, encourage our partners uh, to also uh, think about that. And whatever it they tell us, we are here to listen to them. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm going to come to you, Rogers, next. Before I, 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 put, I give the floor to the to the to the to the audience, and it's really about if you had one piece of advice to give to a, a microfinance association um, who are thinking about you know. Uh, going down the road, uh, road of, of, um, of providing, helping provide insurance products for their members, what would be the, the, the one thing you, you would advise them to, to do or not to do maybe? Um, one piece of advice. And then I'll, I'll ask the same thing to Syed as well. Okay. All right, so one thing that works is collaboration. People must work together. Yes, as uh, institutions under one umbrella, you compete with each other, but we must learn how to collaborate. It's worked for us in Nigeria. Um, the, l let me say that um, Nigeria is one of the most difficult countries to do microfinance, you know, for several reasons, but that's not the topic for today. But what we have done is to come together to, to take a lot of uh, sector development initiatives Today we have the microfinance learning and development center developed by us, one training center for you know all of us. Today we have the microfinance development company, which uh, deals with all the institutions, uh, liquidity training, uh, fund management, digital technology for small institutions that cannot build their own uh, digital technology. Now what are we doing next? We are setting up our own micro insurance company because it is only us that understand what our clients want. And so because of regulatory issues, we are going to the regulator and we're saying, we want to own our own insurance company owned by us. So this simple word is collaborate, do things together, identify what your clients need and pursue it you know, with a common purpose. You will all make money, you will all survive and you will build stronger institutions. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rogers. Said, do you have anything that you'd like to add from yeah. your experience? So I think uh, what is very cr critical is that you do a landscaping study and understand the entire ecosystem. Uh, and then uh, what you should do is you should look at uh, who are the enablers and who are going to create problems for you. So once you have uh, done this uh, exercise, things becomes much easier for you to do. Secondly, as uh, my uh, friend mentioned, um, it has to be a demand-based product. So it has to be backed by some uh, research, demand-side research that has been done. So that the product is to the requirement of the client and the relationship between the MFI and the commercial uh, insurance company should be a win-win uh, model. Thanks. Thank you, Said. Um, I'm going to pass it over to the floor and uh, ask you guys if the, to put up your hands if you have any any questions that you'd like to, to ask. So we, we discussed whether we'd take one question at a time and we'll, we, we decided to take one question at a time, didn't we? Yeah. So if you can uh, stand up and tell us tell us your name and your organization. And, and who you're directing your question to would be great. Uh, merci pour la parole. Uh, je voudrais tout d'abord uh, remercier Rogers et uh, Ovia pour leur belle présentation. Je viens de la République démocratique du Congo. Je suis uh, le directeur général d'une société de microfinance qui s'appelle Ekima. Et spécialement, je viens de la RDC au, nord, uh, au nord, précisément à Goma. Euh, ma question, c'est pratiquement un casus parce que euh, Goma, c'est une ville à haut risque de catastrophes naturelles. Et je dois vous informer que la clientèle de Goma est très résiliente, mais aussi euh, notre organisation. 
Mais pour consolider notre résilience, nous avons commencé les discussions avec les compagnies d'assurance qui sont là. Et je dois également vous avouer que c'est une nouvelle notion en RDC. Mais les questions ou les discussions avec ces compagnies d'assurance montrent qu'il y a des questions qui sont exclues. Il y a la ville est permanemment sous la menace du volcan Niragongo qui peut exterminer toute la ville, qui peut manger la ville en un instant. Et donc, dans les discussions avec les assureurs, il ressort que cette question ne serait pas prise en compte alors que c'est les vrais risques pour cette ville-là de Goma. Je ne sais pas, Rogers et Ovia, comment est-ce que vous pouvez nous orienter dans votre expérience Comment ça peut se passer pour des cas comme ça Alors, j'ai une deuxième question. C'est une question euh, adressée spécialement à Rogers. Euh, j'ai entendu, je ne sais pas si c'est ça, euh, qu'au Nigeria, euh, la micro-assurance, les gens, ils sont réticents, ils ne veulent pas prendre leur assurance. J'ai l'impression que c'est optionnel. Euh, comment ça se passe Parce que chez nous, dans les discussions avec les compagnies d'assurance, parce qu'on n'est pas autorisé à faire de l'assurance, en tant qu'institution de, dans des microfinances. Et donc, dès lors qu'on signe le contrat de partenariat avec une compagnie, l'assurance n'est pas optionnelle, devient plutôt obligatoire dans la commercialisation de produits. Comment ça se passe avec le NMP Merci. OK. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, my friend, uh, before I could, I didn't pick your name, but I gather that you're from the Depo um, Democratic Republic of Congo, and you come from the northern part, uh, Ekima, uh, for the Goma people um, who are exposed to a lot of natural um, resources. Um, I am not an insurance expert, Ovia is, so I'm sure when uh, she takes the microphone, she'll probably tell you, but I'll tell you what we have done. It's what mindset do you use to um, ap approach any problems you know, that you have? In the microfinance um, sector in Nigeria, we have come together to say we will solve you know, our problems, and that's what led to this issue. My personal opinion is that anything can be insured. It's about what is the cost of the insurance and how do you deliver it. So if you, you, if you want to insure against volcanic eruption, you can. If the insurance company says he cannot insure it, come together. What is insurance? Insurance is the pooling of risks together. So if you pull resources together to take care of any eventualities that will happen, for example, if a volcanic eruption will consume a whole city, how about preparing to relocate if it happens? That's insurance. Insurance doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be paid money. After insurance is about surviving the aftermath of any um, risk. So I think that um, one thing that you can do is if the existing insurance companies do not are reluctant to take up products, because what usually happens is that people like to sell to you. Like Charles said, somebody wants to give you an umbrella when it's not raining and then take it out when you have, you know, you, you, you have the risk of being beaten by rain. So you should come together and develop products in Nigeria, we are not allowed to sell insurance until the insurance guideline came out. And it didn't also make us, you know, insurers. What it does is make us, permit us to be agents. But we have said, no, we've come together. We've developed our own products. We've appointed a licensed insurance company to underwrite it. And we're going the next for that to say, give us a license to offer insurance so that we can develop products that meet our needs and the needs of the clients. Um, I come from a part of the world where it believes that if you don't solve your problem, nobody will solve it to you. You are right about insurance in Nigeria. People don't take insurance unless you probably force them to do so. And I think it's natural with uh, the human tendency. If you don't make putting of seat belt compulsory, many people will not wear their seat belts. Okay, maybe until an accident happens and you saw how you could have been saved, you know, if you had worn a seat belt, maybe. So it's, I think it's natural in us. So for us and for this product, that's why we said for insurance products that are associated with lending, it is mandatory. It's compulsory. If you're going to take my money, we must ensure the risks that are associated with this money. 
there are the products that are voluntary optional for example those attached to um, savings products in another but for us to give you money right now we are saying these risks must be insured at least in such a manner that should anything go wrong it's a win-win situation we get something you get something i, I don't know if i addressed um, the issue thank you bit to add yeah to add on what uh, rogers has just said um by the way, no one will ever wake up in the morning and maybe say that I feel like buying insurance unless that product is compulsory. So insurance <laughs> is different from other uh, financial institutions. So it's us to change that mindset to make sure uh, people know what insurance m means and uh, at, at one point they feel they need uh, to buy that insurance even if the product is not compulsory. Anyway, uh, back to your question, uh, you said about volcanista, yeah, for sure, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a bad risk, and uh, like Roger said, any risk can be insurable, but what I can advise you is, uh, of course, when you go back, you don't, don't just sit in your boardroom and say, oh, wow, so now, because there is this risk, let's now design the product and uh, sell to people. You have to do research, go meet the people that are, uh, especially the people that are uh, mostly affected. You know, it, it normally happens in one place, so you know, you can go visit those people, do some uh, uh, market research, uh, make sure you, you find out if really these people need this product, and uh, of course, uh, again, affordability, how we, we, need af we, we need to be affordable for them. So you have to know their levels of income and then from there you know how you will price this product. So to me, I feel it's a risk that can be insurable, but again, you have to do a deep research, ask people, see if they will really uh, buy this product. Of course, uh, Volcanist also, uh, it affected us in our, you know, Rubavu and that, that side, even here in Kigali, after, the incident. We spent like the whole month in uh, with earthquake and people were saying that it's because of that uh, volcanist. And for us here we have um, a cover for earthquake. So people during that time they ran to us, you know, buying this earthquake cover. So if we had uh, this risk of volcanist, I'm sure they would come to us asking for this product. But uh, in Rwanda I think we, are, we still have uh, we are still safe uh, when it comes to volcanism, but of course, it's a risk that can be insurable, I'm sure. Thank you. Thanks, Sylvia. This question about voluntary versus mandatory is, is um, the person in white. So what we're going to do, we're going to take three questions. Um, we've only got five minutes left of the session, so if we can take a question from the man in the white first. Uh, merci. Moudibo Dambele. Euh, institution de microfinance Niasikisou Mali. Bonjour, euh, bon Merci bien. J'ai deux questions. La première, c'est euh, au présentateur du Nigeria. Il dit que c'est leur institution, c'est une nouvelle institution d'assurance. Et que, si j'ai bien compris l'explication, hein, c'est venu suite à des pandémies de Covid où il y a eu des difficultés. Maintenant, ils ont livré des produits d'assurance. Est-ce que présentement, il y a eu des cas de sinistres qu'ils ont eu à gérer Et comment les bénéficiaires ont fait pour souscrire, sinon payer les primes d'assurance, étant donné que le problème était déjà là La deuxième question, ça revient à madame au Rwanda. Et ils assurent les bétails. Moi, je suis curieux de comprendre comment est-ce que le bétail est assuré ici, parce que chez nous, ceux qui gèrent les bétails, c'est des pelles. Je ne sais pas, les pelles maliens, si c'est la même chose au Rwanda. En tout cas, je veux comprendre le mécanisme, comment ils font pour assurer les bétails. Et s'il y a eu des cas, des sinistres, j'aimerais quand même qu'elles partagent ça avec nous. Merci. Merci. Should we take some other questions? Um, here. Je ne vous ai pas reconnu. Bakwali, ok, merci. Je suis M. Savadogo, d'Aouda du Burkina. 
Et je voudrais d'abord faire un commentaire et une contribution suite aux différentes présentations. C'est vrai, c'est un sujet passionnant, la micro-assurance au profit des institutions de microfinance. Je, je pense que c'est un, un sujet d'actualité et chaque SAM, ça revient. Et le commentaire, c'est concernant l'assurance en tant que telle. Il faut, il faut retenir que l'assurance, il faut dire que c'est un risque que nous partageons. Ça veut dire l'assuré partage avec le suspecteur. Et ça ne peut marcher tant qu'il n'y a pas de mutualisation des primes et la mutualisation des risques à gérer. Ça ne peut marcher tant qu'on n'appliquera pas la loi des grands noms. C'est ça qui fait l'assurance. Que ce soit l'assurance ou la micro-assurance, il faut noter qu'il n'y a pas de micro-sinistre. Un sinistre égale un sinistre. Et toutes les institutions de micro-finance dans la salle ont des cartographies de risque. Et dans nos cartographies de risque, l'assurance intervient dans nos cartographies de risque parce que le risque, il y a des risques que nous ne pouvons pas gérer à l'interne. Nous sommes obligés de transférer ces risques à un spécialiste pour les gérer. Parce que nous savons, si nous les gardons à l'interne de l'institution, le jour que le risque va survenir, le coût est fatal. Raison pour laquelle, moi, je pense qu'il faut vraiment nouer un partenariat avec les compagnies de micro-assurance existantes dans toute l'Afrique pour justement faire avancer c'est le maillon manquant dans les institutions de microfinance aujourd'hui, l'aspect assurance. Je l'ai dit parce que et en Afrique de l'Ouest, il y a une compagnie d'assurance qui devrait couvrir un risque de 14 millions de dollars. Et si la compagnie couvre le risque, elle ferme porte. Elle ferme porte. Parce que la compagnie d'assurance est une entreprise comme l'IMF comme l'IMF, et elle fait face à des exigences, à des réglementations, autant que l'IMF, autant que la banque, même si c'est des réglementations différentes. Et elles ont un devoir de respecter un certain nombre de ratios prudentiels, notamment le ratio de solvabilité et le ratio de couverture des engagements. Parce que si vous prenez une prime de 100 francs, la garantie peut atteindre 200 000. Si le contrat dure trois ans, vous devez pouvoir assurer le souscripteur que s'il y a un risque, au bout des trois ans, vous devez, vous devez pouvoir couvrir les 200 000 ou 150 000. Donc, le régulateur surveille ça. Il ne s'agit pas de collecter des primes. Je parle parce que j'ai fait 30 ans de la, dans la microfinance avant d'aller regarder ce qui se passe dans la... De, pardon, dans la microfinance, avant d'aller regarder ce qui se passe dans les compagnies de micro-assurance. Et c'est quand je suis arrivé que j'ai compris la complexité. C'est vrai, les compagnies d'assurance micro ont une mauvaise image. Et l'image, c'est quoi C'est le règlement des sinistres. Vous prenez une prime aujourd'hui, et quand il y a un sinistre, logiquement, vous devez régler le sinistre là dans 10 jours ou 30 jours maximum. Ils vont traîner un mois, un an sans régler le, la, la prime. Et c'est ça qui constitue le problème au niveau des, des compagnies de micro-assurance avec les IMF. Il faut que nous soyons proactifs dans les règlements justement des sinistres. Il ne s'agit pas de collecter les primes et quand il y a un sinistre, vous reculez. Ce n'est pas ça le partenariat. C'est pour cela, dans la négociation, il faut être fort, négocier quelqu'un. Il faut que le partenariat soit gagnant-gagnant entre l'IMF et la société de microfinance, parce que c'est important. Quelqu'un a parlé de commission. Mais les sociétés de microassurance ont un rôle à jouer qui ne joue pas aujourd'hui. Je l'ai dit, c'est l'éducation assurantielle. On a fait l'éducation financière dans les IMF, l'épargne et le crédit. Mais en assurance, personne ne fait l'éducation. Et c'est la responsabilité des acteurs. Quand je dis acteurs, les compagnies de microassurance, 
les IMF et les partenaires. Je pense que ça, c'est un élément important qu'il va falloir, les années à venir, que nous puissions nous inscrire dans l'éducation de nos souscripteurs et les souscripteurs potentiels. Je finirai par la question Merci. aux deux intervenants. Je voudrais quand même que vous nous, vous nous donnez un peu, quelqu'un l'a abordé, quel est votre taux de sinistralité Et justement, comment vous faites pour que vos produits volontaires soient consommés par les membres Parce qu'en dehors du décès emprunté lié au crédit, les autres sont volontaires. Et quand il s'agit de l'assurance volontaire, pour amener quelqu'un à souscrire, ce n'est pas facile. Parce que l'assurance ne s'achète pas, ça se vend. Et je voulais savoir quel est votre taux de sinistralité et quelles sont les dispositions que vous prenez pour faire accepter vos produits volontaires et les relations avec les autres compagnies Vous êtes des compagnies de micro-assurance. Quelles sont vos relations avec les autres compagnies et les relations avec le régulateur Merci, je m'excuse d'être un peu. Ok, merci, merci. <rire> Thank you very much, uh, my friend from Burkina Faso. Um, I think next time you need to put him here because uh, he's got more um, ideas than most of Okay, but thank you. Uh, because of time, I'll go straight to your um, question. Um, what is the rate? For, for us, it has to first be compulsory as long as you want to borrow. You see, uh, people need to test and see the beauty in microinsurance and then it begins to um, you know, work. So it has to be mandatory for people who want to borrow money because the protection is for the customer, the protection is for the institution, the protection is for practically every um, stakeholder. What do we do to make them take it voluntarily? It's only when they have tested and see, for example, if it happens to you, um, you, you, you borrow money to um, farm and then there is erosion or there is flood and you lose everything and all hopes are lost and then the insurance company provides um, you know support your loan in the bank is paid and you have money to start another session uh, I think after that experience you won't need anybody to tell you to take insurance next time so I think that uh, making it mandatory uh, is good to protect both the institution and the customer but more than that it helps the clients to now get the experience and, uh, and benefits of what micro um, insurance is all about. Um, to the first person who asked um, a question, he says, are we able to get the insurance companies to uh, make payment? What we have done in the system, we are not insurance. We are trying to start our own insurance company, but we have an MOU with an existing micro insurance company. And part of that MOU is that when there is a, a risk that has crystallized, the MFI will complete the necessary documentation and forward to the microinsurance company. It is in the MOU that payment must be made within 48 hours. Because microinsurance deals with small amounts of money, small people crowd, we do not want the problems of the big insurance companies where delay in paying claims is a very big disincentive. So for this one, is part of the MOU that if there is a, a claim that arrives from the moment that um, the documents are verified, payment must be made for eight hours. The other thing we have also done is because there are small amounts, um, the institution can also take the option of actually paying their clients as long as the micro insurance company certifies the claim documents. You can actually pay your client and then get re in bust. So it's important for us that uh, claims are paid promptly as they happen. We think this would be a very great incentive to make uh, um, um, people uh, increase the uptake for micro insurance. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with uh, Mr. Dogo's questions, then I'll go to Bandola's questions. Yeah, uh, Mr. Dogo was asking, uh, he was like asking himself like uh, having a, an asset of 14 uh, million US dollars, how can we share, how can the bank, the insurance and the clients share that risk? Uh, anyway, like you said, it depends on the regulation, but here for us in our micro insurance regulation, it stated that, uh, and that's article 32 of our regulation point three, it states that any single risk that, 
that comprises or that goes above 10% of your paid up share capital should be reinsured. So that means you should have uh, a, reinsur a treaty, reinsurance treaty uh, for, that gives you a, big, a good capacity for you to, to be able to, uh, to cover any risk. But of course, again, like Roger said, with microinsurance, you don't expect to insure a 14 million US dollars asset. That's for maybe for conventional insurers. So our sum insured is really uh, not that huge. It's, uh, it's small. And again, of course, that goes with premium is also small. So in any case, uh, the insurer is able to pay uh, whatever cost uh, of the claim, uh, of course, uh, with the help of the insurer where necessary. And uh, you talked about delays in paying claims. Uh, of course, uh, you put it in your in the contract, for, uh, like he said, they have 40, you said 48 hours? Actually, uh, for us, uh, we had 73 hours, but we are reducing it to 40, 40 something hours. And then we, sometimes we go to two hours, three hours, depending on the, I mean, when we get the, the, the full documentation supporting that claim. So we don't really, with, with micro insurance, you shouldn't delay paying that claim because any, any minute or any hour, you know, um, matters uh, to, to our low income earners. And uh, training of the youth, you're right. We should really train, like I said, we should train people, train the youth, train our market segments uh, for them to at least to know um, the, the, the goodness of insurance and uh, for them to wake up at, where at one moment and they feel they should uh, buy some of the products that we sell to them. Uh, Mr. Badolo said, talked about uh, livestock insurance, uh, how we do it. Uh, like I said in my presentation, we do this product with the, with the government of Rwanda. It's, uh, it's um, an, in a national, um, national insurance agriculture scheme, uh, whereby we insure cattle, milking cattle or heifers, not bulls, but it's up to you. You can include bulls. But uh, in our market study, we found that uh, bulls, uh, you know, can resist somehow, and we needed to insure cattle that give milk uh, to our low-income people. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, we insure diseases, illness of any sort, drought, because even drought can kill cattle, floods. Uh, those are the, the risks that we insure in our livestock policy. And uh, again, accidents. So. The government pays 40% premium subsidy, and the client pays 60% uh, of premium subsidy. So some clients come to us direct, because we have um, a great network of veterinary officers all over the country. But again, like I said, uh, some, some clients go to microfinance institutions, and they, 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 they are given policy documents from there. So that's how, in brief, uh, that's how our livestock scheme works. But, uh, Again, uh, I'll give you my card so that we can keep on uh, exchanging ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ovia. And I think we've run out of time now. We've actually gone 10 minutes over, so I do apologize for going over. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to, 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 to catch these people. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Thomas, Ovia, and Said for, for their, their, their interac interactions. And just to you know, finish up this session that, you know, I, you know in terms of increasing, you know, improving the reputation of insurance. In the words of a, a former American president, let's make insurance great again. And on that word, thanks.